Good evening, everybody. Welcome to um, our talk this evening, hosted by the Swampscott Conservancy and the Swampscott Library. I am Colleen Hitchcock. I'm one of the board members for the Conservancy. Um, and so just want to welcome you. If you are unfamiliar with the Conservancy, we are a local nonprofit in town. Our work focuses primarily on um, elevating and enhancing our open spaces, doing environmental education activities, such as this evening here tonight, um, doing participatory or citizen science activities with community members, um, and generally trying to do good things as they relate to the environment vis-a-vis -vis the natural world. Um, it's my pleasure this evening um, to welcome Dr. Sadine von Mering, who is joining us this evening to talk about beginning to end the climate crisis. Um, Dr. Von Mering is a 2023 Public Voices Fellow on the Climate Crisis with the Op-Ed Project, which is in partnership with the Yale Program on Climate Change and Communication. Uh, she's a member of the Faculty in Environmental Studies at Brandeis University, and that's perhaps how we know each other. Um, <clears throat> she is currently... Uh, She's currently co-editing co a handbook on grassroots climate activism. Today, she's going to be talking about her translation of the German youth climate activists Luisa Norbauer and Alexander Rip Hennings, Beginning to End the Climate Crisis, A History of Our Future. Uh, she is both a university teacher and a climate organizer, and since 1998 has been at Brandeis, where she has authored three of our climate action plans. Um, and she teaches courses on human, human nature, European perspective, on climate change, eco-feminism, as well as um, courses within the, our language program. And so with that, um, please join me in welcoming Savina to our little town here on Swanscott tonight, and I will hand it over to you to take away the rest. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Colleen. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, I, of course, I didn't author the climate action plans by myself. It was always a huge group of people, but I, I um, participated. So um, thank you all for coming. Um, we're cozy enough that you can interrupt me at any time and ask questions. Um, I'd rather you do that than fall asleep. So, you know, <laughs> if, you, if you ever hear me say something that doesn't make any sense or whatever, um, just, just holler. Um, so, as I was driving up um, to um, Swampscott, I was f feeling a little homesick because I am um, from another ocean, it's not an ocean, <laughs> the North Sea. So I grew up on a little island in the no North Sea in Germany called Langeoog, the one that's shaped like a pistol there, the third from the right, um, in so-called East Friesland. And, um, it looks like this in real, which is very oh, cool. Beautiful. It looks kind of warm, right? It's <laughs> not. <laughs> but the white sandy beach is really real. It's a fabulous um, place to walk. You can walk for hours and hours on that beach. And um, it is a tourist destination. And as you can see, only part of the island is actually inhabited. So the large part that is the long What's that thing of the pistol called? The, the oh. lauf, we say in German. Barrel. The barrel is actually conservation land. So it's, it's a bird colony mainly, and, um, um, and then there's a little forest which, is, which was grown in, in, uh, uh, to cover up the fact that Hitler built a, an airport there, <laughs> which is still there. But um, it's a very nice place, and one of the um, nicest things about it, I'm, I'm, getting used to the mouse here, is, um, so there's about 2,000 people living there year-round and 10,000 tourists in summer, but it is a car-free island. So there's only horse carriages and bicycles. And um, here you see the horse carriages. And, and so it, it, you know, I lived there for eight years and it really gave me a sense that living without cars is just so logical um, because the air is perfect and, and you can really um, breathe. And yeah, um, it's, you know, this is what the beach looks like. And these islands in the north of Germany are all threatened, of course, by sea level rise, just like you are here on the coast. And um, 
the problem with the projection is that even the baked in projection of 40 centimeters is um, a big problem because this is, it's called the Wadden Sea, this whole area is, is conservation land now. Um, and it, it's a very um, rich biotope. It's very ecologically very rich. And um, for example, we have seals um, and, ah. and tides, and right, they need the tide to rest and breed and the sea level rise changes that so that they wouldn't have places to rest and breed. So, Hopefully, things will be wobbly as they used to be in the hundreds of years, but um, this, it's a big threat. It's a threat to the islands also because of sea level in intrusion into the um, drinking water bubble that's underneath the island. That is really the only drinking water we have. And so if that happens, then mm -hmm. water would have to be brought in from the mainland, which would be a huge cost and, and you know difficulty. So. So that's why you know I, I feel a little um, relationship <laughs> with with your town. Um, I'm sure that you are here because you care about the climate crisis and you know about the climate crisis. So um, I just wanted to bring in a few slides to bring us bring us focus us on the the main issue. And maybe I should move this a little bit so that I don't always look away from you all. Does that make sense? I don't want to cover you, but that's what I, I want to look at you, not um, So we are dealing with incredibly high temperatures, and that is the reason we're seeing Arctic ice uh, shrinking. We're seeing dramatically catastrophic weather events. We're seeing the ocean acidification and warming. We're no longer advancing. Oh, hmm? we oh they were, they, not they were out of sync, sorry. Oh, sorry, I see your okay. Screens. Yeah. Oh, it's just slow, I guess. Yeah. And of course, air quality issues, as we saw last year with all the wildfires. Um, th some of these slides are from the climate reality training with Al Gore that I did a few years ago. So, um, so we, have, we have a problem, right? We know we have a problem. We have a problem of drought. We have a problem of wildfires, of flooding, of storms. Um, and we have a problem that is very um, heavily impacting people who have contributed the least mm -hmm. to it, right? Which means that the areas that are going to be most in uninhabitable in the near future are already the areas that are suffering from other multiple uh, conflicts and, and you know, impacts, and they are the areas of where the people live who really have not um, emitted any carbon. Mm -hmm. um, so, and it also, you know, one of the issues that people don't really like to talk about when it comes to climate change is that it also impacts our ability to feed people and we are still a growing population on Earth and of course we are seeing um, through these extreme weather events uh, yields declining of basic food <laughs> Um, crops and um, and I also read somewhere that the nutritional value also is declining of the food that we can grow so that's another issue we're losing um, land-based species at a very high rate um, <laughs> this is a, a German um, slide but I like to use it because um, it, it helps us sort of to understand that here in the United States, we really have a bigger responsibility than elsewhere, right? So worldwide, we're using up about an Earth and a quarter of an Earth. And this may already have increased because I think the slide is a few years old. Um, but as you can see, the United States is using up many more Earths. And
private to EU. So it may be a few years old, but the, and China is now, of course, way higher, right? So we, we are, um, but the point of this is most people think, well, why would it matter if we did anything yes. when there's so many other people around the world? But the truth is, you know, we can really make a difference. And our lifestyle is just not compatible with um, where we need to be. But we have solutions. We have um, alternatives. We have alternatives in terms of energy with solar. We have alternatives in terms of heating, for example which is you know, a, a really exciting um, possibility. And we are finally now also investing in offshore wind, which other countries like Denmark have done for decades. And um, I just wanted to show you this is the view from the island, um, from, from my island, <laughs> my island. Um, so, and this is also a picture that is a few years old. And so there are, you know, onshore wind is a lot cheaper to deploy than offshore wind. It's wind, it's not as popular among communities, but it is much cheaper to deploy and it's much cheaper to, f to maintain. Um, and um, therefore sort of a much more cost effective measure to address um, climate problems. So um, in terms of the carbon budget, we're clearly <laughs> in trouble. We, we have very limited time um, to actually get to zero. Um, and, you know, we have the keeping within two degrees, ideally within 1.5 degrees Celsius, but we have um, not made the progress that we need to make. So, um, that brings me to the book. So, I, as, as Colleen has said, I have been um, working, uh, um, teaching, talking about this, and I was thinking I should write a book about this because what, what I found was that many people were, at first they were not aware of the problem. When they started to be aware, they were very quickly so aware that they thought, oh, this is terrible and we can't do anything, and then they stopped being aware again. And so I wanted to make a book that would get people out of their seats and actually do stuff. Um, and then I read this book, which is, you know, I read it in German and written by these two young people, and I thought, huh, that kind of is the book that I wanted to write. <laughs> And they already did it, and I thought it, I, it, it makes sense to, to actually tell this story through the eyes of young people because they are the ones that are going to be living with this much longer than I am. So um, just a quick word about the two. So Luisa um, is now 25. Alex is 30. They... Um, they happened to be in Sweden together one summer um, where they were working with the foundation that hands out the alternative uh, Nobel Prize, so-called, the um, um, Right Livelihood Award, it's, it's officially called. Um, and they were looking for examples of people that have actually done things about problems that they felt needed to be addressed. And... Um, and that's how they met, and that's how they decide, started talking, and then they decided something needs to be done. And, and it wasn't initially a book about climate change. It was really initially a book about social justice and the, you know, the disparities in terms of equity. Um, but then at some point, and they describe in the book how that became a book about climate and climate activism. So the German title from Ende der Klimakrise uh, literally means about the end of the climate crisis. It, it also has a ring of a fairy tale. <laughs> so there's a, a little bit of a pun in that title. Um, and then Eine Geschichte unserer Zukunft also has a, a little bit of a pun because the word Geschichte in German means both, both story and history. So they were both saying, we're going to tell you a story, but they were also looking at 
the present as history from the perspective of the future, which you know we weren't able to translate as well into the English title. But you know that's <laughs> I'm not a professional translator. I guess that's why. Um, so Louisa, um, in the course of writing this book, became the person for the Fridays for Future uh, climate strike movement in Germany, inspired by Greta Thunberg in Sweden with her you know, protest. And Luisa uh, took that on and became very involved and became sort of the, the figurehead of the organization that became a worldwide phenomenon, right? The f f uh, school strikes for the climate, which never became a huge thing in America because strikes are probably considered problematic in America, but um, that was also a reason why I wanted to bring the book into English because I really felt that we needed more of that here. Um, and so last year we were able to launch it at Brandeis um, Luisa wasn't able to come in person, so she was joining us uh, via Zoom <laughs> behind uh, on the back. Uh, but Alex was there on crutches. <laughs> and, um, and Bill McKibben, who kindly wrote the foreword, joined us in person. And that was very helpful, of course, because he knows Luisa and he um, you know, drew a big crowd. And so we, we had fun launching the book together. Um, so, so what is the what is in the book. So what the, what the two of them did is they start out by talking about the future as a dystopia. And they start out very dark. <laughs> um, I'm just reading it with my students together and the students are like, ooh, this is really dark. So at the beginning, it's really dark because they are describing what they are growing up with, with the dis you know, from what they learn in, in science class. Um, and they then also look at the or you know look at what hasn't been done by the generation of my age and, and older um, and so because you are stealing our future is a, is one of the slogans that the group uses a lot at their at their protests um, and they also look for example at Nauru uh, you know, in the Pacific and show how the climate problem was always, from the beginning, very clearly intersected with other forms of oppression in terms of colonialism and racism and capitalism and so on. Um, and Nauru being like a, a, a microcosm where um, things <laughs> deteriorated uh, in ways that, you know, when you read the chapter you feel like, okay, this is basically what has happened now all over the world. Um, and so um, in it, it, part of it also talks about um, the question why that is. Like, why have we not made more progress given that we have known for such a long time that this needs to be addressed? Um, and one of the issues, of course, is uh, the fact that, especially in the United States, where we have partly the biggest problem, the oil and gas companies have now, we know that, <coughs> systematically um, lied to us and, and uh, spread false information <coughs> about this. Um, and that has, of course, also extremely polarized our political system. And unfortunately, that is still ongoing, right? So you still have enormous profits on the side of the, the oil and gas industry. And part of that money is being used to buy politicians who will not take the action that needs to be taken. Um, and I don't know if any of you have seen the film Merchants of Doubt. Um, you have, you would agree with me that that film really explains why we haven't made any progress, That's very good. right? So it's based on a book by Naomi Oreskes and Eric Conway. And Naomi is at Harvard and Eric was at NASA. And they basically show how the oil and gas industry, the fossil fuel industry, used the playbook of the tobacco industry to systematically um, lie to people about the climate crisis against their better knowledge. They had hired climate scientists, they knew exactly what was going on. And after initially the United States 
politics or the, the government had been pretty bipartisan on this issue. It wasn't a polarizing issue for a long time. Um, they made sure that it became a polarizing issue and that there was one party that would support them and not move forward on climate action. Um, and they spent an inordinate amount of money and they also discredited the very climate scientists who were trying to move things in the right direction. So to the point of threatening them, right? So climate scientists are interviewed in the, in the film um, and there's one particularly um, jarring interview with um, Mike, Mark Morano, one of the um, people who uh, is very active on this m misinformation train, and he has a blast um, joking about how he um, got all these climate scientists' death threats for, you know, just for fun, basically, just to discredit them and to and to also scare them and you know intimidate them and so on. So I always say that this is a must see. You can watch it on, on Amazon. If you want to understand why we haven't made more progress, that is the film to watch or the book to read. Um, so in the next chapter, they talk about the lack of a utopia. So, you know, they have this dystopic vision for the future and they feel that people are also sort of paralyzed by that. And, and not actually able to articulate what could be done and how could it be done differently. And um, despite the fact that we were supposedly at the end of history <laughs> after the Berlin Wall fell, um, what, what they're seeing is instead you know, a, a uh, further and further um, a disintegration of, of a healthy system. Um, and then what they do really well, and that's, I think, why I want the book, especially in the hands of young people, but anyone really who is interested in becoming active, is the biggest problem with the climate crisis is that it seems overwhelming, right? And that everyone thinks, oh, God, how, how are we possibly going to tackle this? And what I really like in the book is that they break it into smaller parts and they show that you don't have to solve the climate crisis you can tackle the crisis the crisis smaller parts of the crisis and and thereby become really effective and um, so what they do then in several chapters is they show for example climate crisis is not an individual crisis we are always told to watch our carbon footprint to you know, to recycle and, you know, all the things that people tell us to do and we then can feel good about ourselves. And they say no, because, <laughs> you know, we are not able to deal, to actually uh, deal with a climate crisis this way. It's, it's, it's a frustrating um, impasse. And so, um, that is a, a recognition that this requires a systemic approach and a collective approach and, and not an ind individual one. Um, this is an image um, I am using from, from a photo exhibit that we had last year by Barbara Dombrowski. Um, so this is the um, demolition of one of the last villages near a coal um, pitch, um, uh, um, coal, oh my god, the, what's pit. the word, pit, <laughs> right, in, in um, the Rhineland, um, and so what they're talking about in this chapter is that there are responsibilities at different levels, right, locally, regionally, um, nationally, internationally, um, and people are just not taking responsibility for the actions. And so that needs to change. And, um, and there are different approaches to changing that. Um, one example, for example, is that um, Luisa and several others sued the German government for having a climate law that wasn't actually meeting the requirements of the Paris Agreement. 
And the constitutional court, the highest court in Germany, gave them right and said, you're right. Um, the government needs to do more because the government is also required to protect future generations, which is really interesting. The responsibility goes beyond the current existing population to also to the future generations. And there are a number of constitutions that now say that. And, and that's... Um, you know, a, a, a way in, and so litigation is, of course, also a major major part of climate action. Then they talk about climate crisis as a crisis of communication, um, and our problem with framing, right? That we oftentimes get present get a problem presented to us in a way that we get distracted by the framing, and we don't realize that this is actually the same thing, right? Because we, we're, we're focusing in on something that is specifically chosen to distract us from, from the truth. And um, so that is something um, that happens a lot in, in social media, but also in, ma in mainstream media. Um, and it's not really taught, and so, they are saying, okay, we, we just need to change the communication about this. We need to teach people how to communicate properly and how to educate the communicators. <clears throat> um, then they talk about fossil capitalism. Um, and uh, yeah, one example is a, a, a subchapter about this idea that we could, you know, we could sort of monetize. <laughs> Um, uh, nature and put a price on nature. Um, and this is interesting. My, my students are very interested in this idea that capitalism is the problem. <laughs> um, and it is, um, you know, we, we just saw last week with the decision about the LNG terminals. Did, I don't know if people noticed what happened there, but the, the Biden administration agreed to pause um, the expansion of LNG export facilities in the Gulf region. And that was a huge win for the climate movement because people had been pushing for that for years and they had, you know, Third Act had mobilized and said, we're going to throw down next week in Washington and people were going to get arrested. And so finally, um, the administration said, okay, we're going to pause this. Um, and that you know, and if you look under the hood of this particular issue, you see that this expansion is entirely only of interest to the fossil industry itself. Uh, nobody needs the gas. In fact, the export, export, the growth of the export facilities would increase gas prices and, and energy prices for Americans. So it's, it's, it would increase inflation, it would make things worse here, but it would line the pockets of the very companies who have, as you saw, raked in record profits over the last few years. So, um, so it is a perfect example of this, of this kind of capitalism that is completely out of control. Um, and that needs to be addressed and that can be addressed. And so then they talk about the crisis of prosperity. Um, and that is a place where the generations sort of clash a little bit because, you know, if you look at the post-World War II generation, there was this expectation that things would get better and better and better and people would have, have more and more and more and be more comfortable. And, um, and now this generation is seeing that at least stalling, if not reversing, right? Um, and so suddenly young people say, we can't afford a home, we can't even afford a college degree, we can't really live the way we were brought up, and you know, we can't keep the same level of comfort that our parents had. Um, <clears throat> and that is, of course, in part due to these you know, combined crises, and, in terms of our, um, you know, wrecking the wrecking the biosphere, overusing the resources, and so on, and this is the the donut model that was developed by Kate Rayworth at Oxford, who's an economist and who looked at 
you know, let's, let's visualize what we need to have a functioning social system and, and, and uh, economic and, and environmental system, and which are the parts of this that we need to check, and which are the parts that are already uh, out of control or overused. <laughs> and as you can see, we're in a bad place, right? And so, um, what does that mean for the young generations? Does that mean sacrifices? Does that mean, you know, how do young people grapple with this? Um, is it to, you know, can you be, be creative about um, having prosperous, successful lives um, without using so much energy, right? Mm, then they talk about justice, and justice kind of is a red thread throughout the book. As I said from the beginning, the two of them are very much driven by this idea that this is a this is a, a problem of justice. Um, and I would say that um, the climate movement overall has really moved in that direction that and that was also very much on display last week in the in the bayou in the in Louisiana where you know you had fishermen um, with boats um, protesting and and you had um, frontline communities really taking the lead because they are the ones first of all that have been suffering for decades already under the um, industrial uh, pollution and they are also the ones that have contributed the least, uh, even domestically the least, to, to the problem. And then, um, then the, the last three chapters are really about action. So, you know, we've, we've explained the problem, we've taken the problem apart into sort of doable chunks that we can uh, target, and then um, how, do we, how do we go about doing that. And so they talk about, um, you know, they, they give advice to <laughs> the readers how to educate themselves. Um, and the, the chap chapter that I like the best is uh, called Start Dreaming, um, because there's really an understanding that if we want to solve this problem, we have to be creative. And that means we have to sort of, uh, the way I think about it is, is throw that lasso out to the future and fix it somewhere so that we can pull in the right direction. Um, and they call that moral stretching exercises at the beginning, where we have to really, um, just like a, a yoga exercise, um, we have to really wrestle with the fact that <laughs> what we're doing is not sustainable, it is not just, it is, it is um, you know, it's causing a lot of harm. And, and by confronting that and also really looking straight into the eye of the, of the harm that is being caused, we can then develop the muscle to tackle that and to, and to improve upon it. Um, there's a, a little bit of a um, um, fantasy piece where they sort of describe what that future uh, uh, could look like, um, and then um, they really encourage uh, the readers to to do to be creative and and um, to not be paralyzed by the present chaos and disruption, um, but to use their imagination to develop alternatives and think utopian, as they say it. Um, and then finally they say, you got to get organized, right? And that requires very concrete steps in terms of tactics and um, strategies. And um, they have a whole list of possible strategies that people could use that, are, that include civil disobedience, but it, is, it includes also a whole range of actions. Um, and the, the idea really being that this can be dealt with if you just get off your sofa and, and start doing it. Um, and so that's the book. Um, what I spoke with Louisa today uh, because she's hopefully coming here for uh, several months in the fall. And um, 
what I found really interesting, and you may have seen the, the footage of the big demonstrations in, in Germany this past week um, against the right-wing extremist mm -hmm. party. Um, and this was, to a large extent, um, co-organized by the climate movement. Mm -hmm. um, so they are very involved in that. Um, and, you know, what the, but it was also a, a completely unexpected phenomenon. So it was really interesting compared with the, the climate strikes, right, where, where they had been planning for months and yeah. preparing. This was really a spontaneous eruption of anger on the part of the population. And it was so heartening to see people from all walks of life joining these, these demonstrations. Because what happened is there was a secret meeting by the right-wing extremist party, which is right now polling the second highest in the country. I mean, we're talking people who are flirting with neo-Nazis. And they had a secret meeting, including neo-Nazis, where they decided that millions of Germans should be deported especially people with migratory background, like who had come from other countries, but also um, so-called bio-Germans. And they, and they, yeah, it was a very, and that was leaked by, by journalists. Um, and people were so upset that this was happening, that actually conservative party members were part of this, that they took to the streets across the country, and it's still happening. Every weekend there's more demonstrations. Even in East Germany, where this party is particularly popular, more and more people have been taking to the streets. And so the reason we talked about that today was that I was like, <laughs> we need that here. <laughs> we need that sort of, that cooperation of pro-democracy movement and pro-climate movements here because we're also in trouble with our democracy and um, and the climate movement is a little bit sort of lost <laughs> at the moment, although the LNG decision is certainly helpful. Um, and I think for this year especially, we really need people to come together and say, in order for us to have a livable climate in the future, we need to work together to protect our democracy. And so these images from there are particularly heartwarming for me um, because democracy is not a spectator sport, as I told the students today. Um, so it's really simple, um, and I'm gonna sort of come closer to home now. It's really simple to begin to end the climate crisis um, you can do many, many things, but you cannot afford to do nothing. Um, that's basically it. So my favorite quote, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has, right? Margaret Mead. Um, and that is so true. It, students often come to me and they say, Professor, what can I do? I'm just one person and it's so depressing. And my first question is, what are you doing? And then they sort of look at me, huh? <laughs> um, because just do something, right? Just do something. And if you find another person that you can do it with, or ideally three or five, that's all you need. If you have five people, I mean, look at you guys. You, you have this con conservation. The conservancy. The conservancy, right? You don't know what we're called either. I mean, <laughs> how many people are really actively working on it? That's great, right? And you can make things happen. That's really all you need. You don't need hundreds of people to affect change. And that's, I think that needs to get into people's mind that they understand. Be, for some reason, the bad guys are always really good at this. They know. But on our end, it's like we always think we first have to convince everyone before we can do anything. And I think we just have to do things. Um, so the, the Bible of climate solutions is, of course, Project Drawdown. I don't know how many of you have heard about it. You probably have. You have. Um, so this is a bunch of scientists who are calculating the most cost-effective measures to take for climate action. And um, you'll be surprised what the top two are. Does anyone want to guess? 
what are the top two most cost-effective measures you, we can take to address climate change? Carbon tax. Lawyers. <laughs> 25 Cars. hours by gallon day. Stop driving so much. So the top one is reduce food waste. And the second, second one is plant-based diet. Why is that? Well, reducing food waste, if you think about it, we're wasting, what, 40% of all food that is grown in this country or around the world is thrown out, which is an e enormous carbon footprint, right, from, from growing it, fertilizing the ground, whatever, the, the, trans, you know, the tractors, the, all the machines involved, then harvesting, transportation, cooling, another transportation, keeping it in your fridge, and the packaging and everything, right? But isn't throwing it in the dump actually how it became fossil fuels in the first place? If you put food waste in a, in a, um, in a dump, yeah. then it become, it'll, in 100 million years, it'll become, yeah, it'll be captured. We don't have 100 million years. <laughs> well, it's yes. Not fertilizer again and new food grows, but you still have to expend energy mm -hmm. to yeah. yeah, I mean, I think you're right. Eventually, everything will become... No, but I, I mean, food... What do you mean by food waste? Because food waste is food you don't eat, but it ends up in the ground, right? Where does it end up? Well, it's, most of the food actually ends up in the incinerator. Right, because we actually, I mean, I don't know about you, but in America we have these walk-in refrigerators and most people have them stuffed with things that they forget and then every few weeks they have to throw out half of the stuff in there, for example. No, but no. also the supermarkets. But it, but it ends up in a, in a, a, a landfill. But, but the point is you're making more than you need. Right. So you're intensifying. So, right. you know, if you, you only needed one piece to feed yourself, you're making two pieces, so mm -hmm. increasing transportation, fertilizer, everything. So that's the issue. Right. The, where it ends up. The issue is what has happened before it gets thrown out, right? It has sort of, it has cost carbon before it gets thrown out. And, you know, if you compost what can be composted, then you're do certainly doing your part. But, but doesn't compost make methane gas? If it's treated right, if you put it in the ground, then composting is a sensible thing to do. But, um, but the biggest chunk of this food waste is actually food waste from supermarkets and restaurants. Yeah, and, I mean, and that is like perfectly good food that gets thrown out on a daily basis, right? Um, educating people is a really important thing to do. Electrifying and using free sunshine to power our lives. Making polluters pay because somebody will pay, right? And if we don't make the polluters pay, we all pay. Um, stop further incentivizing growth of the fossil fuel industry. And yes, reducing energy usage. And that can mean all sorts of things. So. You didn't mention it with a plant based diet, like. Uh, oh, yeah, why is that? That was part a lot, right? And the methane, which causes greenhouse emissions. They fart and they and they burp and they produce methane, which is a lot worse. Just like with the LNG what, what issue. What are about what is the statistic? What percent of greenhouse gas is caused by <coughs> by food, uh, by animal agriculture? Animal, uh, agriculture. Yeah, I mean, it depends how you calculate, but people say it's it's more worldwide. It's more than transportation. So it is almost a third, between 20% and 30% usually, depending on you know, which parts you count in transportation versus agriculture. But the, the problem there is, of course, that meat production has a lot do, to do with deforestation because there's a lot of deforestation happening in order to grow the food for the meat. <laughs> not, in, not in the United States. We're not deforesting for we already deforested it. Yeah, no, it's mostly now happening in the global south. No, no, I, We're I, importing I, I it. We're focused on the U.S., but I guess you're looking globally. It doesn't really but, I mean, y your food comes from all over the world, right? That's why we have supply chain issues when there's 
when there's um, rebels shooting on well, when we close on that containers. Plants, Europe is more relied on Russian um, uh, natural gas. Than well, the, gas. Europe actually the now only imports very, very little Russian gas because they sanctioned the Russians. Because China's behind hmm? China it That's, yeah. Russia is still uh, sending gas to China. But the... Um, but the deforestation issue is an issue not only in the global south; it is also happening here, and it is, and and of course the the fact that we're using like 80 percent of soil that can be used for food production for the production of animal feed really doesn't make sense, given that we're losing so much soil um, worldwide all the time, right? Usable soil. So, so going away from animal products in your diet, and you don't have to go cold turkey vegan, is a really simple thing to do. It doesn't cost anything. Everyone can do it. Just, you know, reducing the meat intake, um, and um, you save money that way. So that's something. So um, in terms of activism, um, you know, getting together with people is a really nice thing to do against the cognitive dissonance that climate change impacts you with, right? The feeling that you're constantly living, that they also walk and talk about in the book, that you're all, all the time you're, you're living a destructive lifestyle that is harming uh, people around the world and future generations. So becoming active and doing something about it is a really healthy thing for your, for your mental health. And of course, we want people to decarbonize, right? So um, I don't know if you've heard of Mass Energize, but they have done a really good job getting more and more towns to come up with plans. Um, and they help um, people develop plans and to offer them options. And then everyone can do what their pocketbook allows and, um, and you know, what they need to do um, in terms of decarbonization. And uh, by, uh, in terms of the energy side of things, which is sort of the low-hanging fruit, um, the point is, of course, to electrify so that we can ultimately, ideally, get most of our energy from the sun because it's free. And it's, as you can see in this slide, it's overabundant. You know, for the next few billion years, we have enough solar energy to... to um, power us through. So, and as we've seen, you know, the cost of renewable energy has also dramatically dropped so that it has now become a, an economic argument as well. For a long time, people would say, well, but that's so expensive. And it's just no longer true. Um, so we talked about Project Drawdown. I showed you the, <laughs> the top things there. Um, I think, I think I have one more slide. Um, let me see. Oh, right. So um, let's talk about some concrete things that are happening. But, by the way, what was the time limit? Am I way over already? What did you no, want? I think we're good. I think we planned about an hour, and then we still have a big room for another half hour after that. Really. OK. OK. I, I should have asked you before. OK. Um, so it's a justice issue, as, we, as I've been saying all along. Rich Americans have way higher footprints than other wealthy people in the world. So we really, um, you know, have to. Um, it's a, yeah. So um, one issue, for example, is private jets. So private jets. I don't know if you've heard about the issue in Hanscom, uh, Hanscom Airfield, not to be confused with the airbase. Is um, there is a plan by the developers to triple the hangar size at Hanscom Air, Air, Airfield. And, <clears throat> and that flies in the face of all the climate plans that we are making in Massachusetts because we have committed to net zero by 2050 and already now private jets are actually using 50% of all the solar energy that we've, that we've created uh, is basically nullified by the emissions of private jets, right? If we, if we move to air travel, that is 
based on alternative energy sources, wouldn't smaller planes be the first place that you could do that? So if you build a private jet economy, wouldn't it be the first place you could use alternative energy planes? And Honestly, it sounds good, um, but we, when we deal with renewable energy sources, we also deal with resources, right? There are rare earth minerals, there are uh, limited resources, there's e extraction involved. I wouldn't want th to use those rare resources on private jets when we really need them for public transit, for buses, for all sorts of other things, for, um, you know, private jet travel will always be an incredibly um, luxurious and unnecessary travel, I would say. And so when we look at all the towns, for example, that are making plans, and I know Swampscott has made a plan to decarbonize by 2050, and when we then combine that with the, this is from the, the um, people who are you know, studying this, um, when we combine that with the emissions trajectory for this private jet expansion, then we're really seeing that they don't fit together. And they done the same kind of comparison with just uh, jet plane travel in general? So, so I feel like, um, this goes back to the role of students, I feel <laughs> like there's like a dichotomy of students caring about the climate, but um, that our generation of young people, and it's, pro it's our fault, our, the parents' fault, <laughs> our, all, all of our faults, are, feel very comfortable with flying regularly. And I feel like a chart like that for um, public, you know, just regular flying would be helpful. Absolutely. Personally, if you have, uh, you know, have done the carbon footprint calculation for your own life, <clears throat> your flying is going to be the biggest chunk. For any individual, if you ever fly on a commercial jet, that is the biggest part. And so if you want to reduce your carbon emissions, not flying is the most effective way of reducing your carbon emissions. It's a, it's a huge chunk, right? I mean, basically one flight across the country uses up all the emissions that you are supposed to use all year. And you are, of course, not just using emissions that one time. So, um, so yes, um, we need to reduce airline travel and we need to um, decarbonize airline travel, absolutely, but, but private jets are for maximum 20 people, whereas big commercial jets, of course, have hundreds of people, so the, the difference is still stark between the two. How's the author getting over here from Europe? How is the author of the book getting over here from Europe? She's going to have to fly. Not yeah. like Greta. Greta, Greta, Greta came with a sailboat. I wouldn't. I wouldn't take the risk of, of forcing her to. No, but you know. Can, can, can you use that chart though to you take U, U.S. and EU as the four town plans, and then look at China as the um, handsome growth rate? And, and yes, we could. But you know what? We can't really influence what China is doing. We can influence what we're doing. And if we doing if we, we do things that people suddenly realize, wow, pollution gets reduced, health care costs get reduced, people can suddenly walk in in their neighborhoods. People have public transportation, so they don't get stressed in traffic. There's so many benefits from addressing the climate crisis right here that China, which by the way is ahead of us when it comes to investing in renewables and so on, would be very well advised to fo follow our lead if indeed we took that leadership. But we haven't actually yet taken that leadership for the reasons that I pointed out. Well, I mean, it looks like a couple of towns in Massachusetts are taking some leadership. Yes, not just these four, but, um, you know, we need a lot more. And, and Is the Hanscom going to go through or are the towns around it influencing it? Well, so one thing that I would love for you all to do is to pass a resolution against it. We're actually going around uh, now asking other towns and cities to do the same because we're all putting money into decarbonization and this expansion flies in the face of all of us, right? If they c get through with this. And so the way it is, there is a process called MIPA process, which is Massachusetts Environmental Protection 
something, agency something. There's a, there's a process that they have to go through, the devel developers and the secretary of the environment then reviews uh, the documents that they submit and there has been a huge comment period about a year ago and then she actually gave them ho a lot of homework, like a thick book full of, of questions and so Within a month or two, I think they will submit their response and then there will be more com public comment and so it's going through the motions. But we're trying to get Maura Healy to just say no because it's, it doesn't make sense. The, what's, the, what's the cost of decarbonization? What does it add to the cost of energy to decarbonize? If you, you know, there isn't the cost, right? Because are you talking on an individual level, a town level, a national um, level, it, international does it, level? Does it increase the cost of BTUs for natural gas if you've got gas heating or if you've got oil heating or if you have electricity? So... Uh, if you're going to still use that... Yes, people you, like talking about costs a lot when they don't really want to talk about climate. But what you really have to look at is cost in terms of damages versus cost in terms of investment into a future that will then become very cheap. My example, I put solar panels on my roof in 2012, right? And I'm not paying... They were subsidized, right? They were subsidized. They were somewhat subsidized, but I spent a lot of money on them. I spent a lot of money and I'm still actually paying on them because I wasn't able to just buy them. I, I'm not wealthy. And what's the lifestyle and what do you do with them when they have to be taken off your roof? What they the life, can be recycled. Are you trolling me or are you no, actually no, serious? Okay, because I feel a little trolled. Yeah. No, no, you, you yeah. just, you haven't really put out a lot of science. You've talked about... I'm not here to talk about science. I'm here to talk about climate activism. Uh, I'm not a scientist. Ask, um, uh, a lot of the, the climate activism is about prohibiting and, and ultimately uh, it's a popularity contest uh, and uh, a lot of people are, are kind of, you know, feel, feel like they're losing their freedoms uh, to do things because of all these prohibitions. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know if this, uh, the, the activism should focus more on the the bigger topics uh, than the, the local ones that prohibiting things, more those really big issues that really cause a lot of uh, climate change. Uh, and, and so maybe technology also invest in technology, uh, like the, all the battery uh, technology to make that cheaper. And yeah. That really causes a step change in, instead of all these prohibitions. So, yeah, this is another talking point that is often launched against um, climate action. What does that actually mean, pro prohibitions, right? What we have right now is a world where we have enormous pollution, we have a, a climate disruption that literally uproots entire villages, destroys entire villages, um, possibly disrupts our food system, as I said at the very beginning. Which villages are being destroyed? Paradise, California, remember? Which one? Paradise. Paradise. Remember? The whole town? Oh, the fire. The fire yeah. because yeah. California doesn't manage the forest correctly. No, that was only one part of the problem. Climate change has, has you know, they can attribute um, climate change now, they can show you within a relatively short time, scientists can show you that climate change is for real part of the problem of these e extreme okay. weather no, events. Yeah. Going on your point about the cost of energy, uh, um, it's an interesting point. To me, it seems like this is a big sale thing. There's a lot of people out there, A, that don't believe in climate change because they're getting misinformation, mm -hmm. misinformation. And there's even people who um, may say, oh, yeah, it's true, but they're not, they don't want to do anything. So the thing is to how to convince people without having it sound like it's a prohibition. And I was thinking about what you said, one of the biggest things is food. Mm -hmm. So maybe the activism has to be getting uh, 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 cooperation or partnership with restaurants to come up with non-meat food that all of a sudden is the hot thing that everybody wants. 
Yeah. You know what I mean? You have yeah. to think in terms of... Very creatively, creative. absolutely. And, and that is also what's found to work best. When you want to convince people that it's healthy, and it is healthy no matter what the climate says, to eat vegetables, right? If you give them vegetables that look like they haven't ever lived, then, <laughs> then they're, they're going to go for the chicken nuggets, right? Yeah. So part of the job is indeed to make it attractive and show that, hey, this is good for you. This is good for your health. This is good for your mood. This is good for, you know, your, how you feel. And then make it attractive. Don't go beyond that. You have to make it trendy. Yeah. For certain people to get into it. Absolutely. And you can certainly get maybe big restaurants to come up with some fancy stuff. Yeah. But how, in my mind, I'm thinking, how do you get McDonald's to do that? That's the trick. Well, they're already, I think they're already selling the Impossible Burger. At least at Burger King, they, they yeah, are. They carry it. It's, it's delicious. No, it's really good. get grocery stores connected with people who need food so that their food isn't, their things that are two days old or whatever, goes so people that need food, nutritious food, get yeah. it. Yeah. Because that's the, uh, that's a marrying of yeah. a need and, and a waste. But what you're hearing here is you already have the solutions, right? It's not rocket science. It's not that complicated. And it isn't really about prohibitions. For some reason, people feel like, oh my God, stuff is going to be forbidden. No, it's not. I mean, anyone can eat whatever they want. What we're saying is, look how much better this would be. Look how this could actually make you healthier, make your life better, and it would have so many positive repercussions, right? We're spending such a, an enormous amount on healthcare issues now that are related in part to, to food. Right, and so a healthier diet is a is a very logical thing. I hear you want to prohibit people from flying private planes, and then eventually prohibit people from driving private cars, so everybody has to go in a bus. Perhaps we so, should just need to reframe that and think about yeah. the opportunity for us to commute as a community with one another and enjoy right. relaxing and interacting with one another versus fighting our way through traffic individually. Yeah, but that's right? like, uh, it's almost like... Uh, no, it's, it's selling right? a different product, right? It's right. We're going to buy into our interactions together as humans versus what we can do on our own. We have hit the hour mark, so I'd like everybody <laughs> to join me in thinking, Sabina. We can definitely have to continue the conversation afterwards, but I just want to make sure that we're respectful of the space right. that we're using. Um, so thank you. Yeah, I, I, I had actually meant to end with your own plan here for Swampscott because I read it um, and I was really impressed. It's a very ambitious plan. It's, it's very well thought out. Clearly a lot of work went into it. Um, and I think for you as a community, for this to work, it would be really good to develop some concrete steps in terms of how do you now make people understand what this plan actually means and how do you actually make sure that it's not just a plan that gets sh shelved, yeah. right? How do you actually realize it, prioritize it, and make people feel that it is theirs and, and then it isn't about prohibitions? Right? If I have a friend, I don't, who, who flies a private jet, um, the point is not, hey, I want to ban your private jet. The point I would have is, can we talk? And can, can I make you understand that your private jet is basically eliminating all the success we've had with all the solar on the, on the roofs? And could you perhaps consider not using your private jet instead and become part of the solution? You know, this isn't about, I mean, first of all, I'm, I'm honestly prohibiting private jets, I don't feel so bad about. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of things that I would prohibit, would understand that people don't like the prohibiting, but a few billionaires not flying to Aruba with their private jet, I don't feel that sorry for them, right? Um, but of course, ultimately, we will have to make some concessions. And I'm sure you all have children or nephews and nieces who are going to be impacted so much more than we are now 
by the consequences. And that alone should be motivation, right? They are going to look at us and say, why did you let this happen? Why did you not do anything when you were aware of what was coming and you know you could have done something? So um, I think that is that is really um, that should be enough motivation for everyone to get on board. But yeah, I want to take questions, so please throw them at me. Yes. Uh, so it sounds like the book um, identified that. It that it's not it, that it's not an individual. It's that not the individual choices that are are driving the problem, and that it, and identify capitalism and all the other things. But it sounds like some of the solutions we're still talking about are encouraging us to focus on our individual choices. And I feel like that's sort of moving. Um, I mean, not to say we shouldn't focus on our individual choices, but mm -hmm. that that's moving us away from thinking of the bigger um, uh, political activism that we should be taking. Good point, and um, I should have talked more about that. So, um, yes, I think Luisa would probably say at this point that she's also changed her mind a little bit <laughs> since the book came out, but um, the way I see it is you... So, for example, when I talk about solar panels on my roof or driving an electric car or whatever, um, making individual choices gives me a chance to show that it can be done, it gives me a chance to talk with other people about my experience doing that and what needs to be improved so that more people can do it. Um, there's a lot of benefits from individual action that actually have sort of a, you know, a collective uh, impact. But you're absolutely right, and that's really what the gist of the book is. We need to work on this together, and we need to come together and demand action, and then we can get much further than individual carbon footprints, because then we can say we want our government to meet these targets, and that means that money needs to be invested accordingly. We are investing the money. You know, people always talk about cost. It's not like we're not spending the money. We're just not spending the money where we should be spending it. And so this is money spent that's coming back to us. That's also something that people don't see. I mean, if I invest in climate protection, I'm investing money that benefits every single person immediately, right? I mean, the, the cleaner the, the air, the better for everyone. And so um, the, the book chronicles at the same time the development of the climate movement that Luisa became a big um, star of in Germany to the point where she now needs protection when she go <laughs> goes to places and, and she um, <coughs> has you know worked with like Prince Charles when he was still <laughs> prince and I mean she's really become a major player in, in um, mobilizing people and she would always say yes it isn't about what I do at home, it is about what we all do together. Why can't I come here by train? Why did I have to drive? It's not because I didn't want to come by train, it is because it was practically impossible because I had to teach and there's only this many ways to come here by train and then I probably wouldn't be able to go back home again. But why is that? It's because of certain decisions that have been made and you know, collectively and by the state and, and by the people, and we can make different decisions that will improve um, everyone's lives. Does that answer the question? Other questions? When you say climate justice, what do you mean? What I mean is that when you look at the statistics, there's a very small number of people that has emitted a lot of carbon over the last 200 years, and there's a very large number of people who haven't, you know? There are most, the majority of people in the world have never been on an airplane, right? Um, the majority of people in the world don't live in large houses and don't drive three cars and so on. So there's, there's a huge difference between contribution to the problem 
um, between different countries. In fact, the, the Paris Agreement takes account of that and says there is common but differentiated responsibility for the problem. We all share the responsibility, but some have contributed a lot more to it than others. So, so that's... Who decides what to do? Well, everyone decides, right? The, the, there's national governments, there's um, state governments, there's local governments. You all decided to have a climate action plan. Um, and there's the, the United Nations process, the COP process, that, by the way, for the first time last year, actually mentioned fossil fuels, which had not happened before. <laughs> In the Paris Agreement, they don't talk about fossil fuels. Right? This is only since last year that it was finally um, decided, official, that the fossil fuels, that we need to stop using fossil fuels um, in order to solve this problem. So, other questions? Yes? Um, I've been following the Fridays for Future. I think he wants the mic because uh, people been are... been following the Fridays for Future, and uh, it seems like it peaked in 2019, then we had the pandemic, then we had the Ukraine uh, crisis, and then we had uh, environmentalists gluing themselves on roads, which didn't really make the general population happy. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing is that Greta Thunberg now is siding in the Israeli-Palestinian <coughs> conflict. Uh, so it, uh, what is Luisa's take on revitalizing her movement? Yeah, I wish I could ask her that directly. but. Um, what I can say is um, that it is very normal for movements to go through such phases, right? It's not very normal to have a pandemic, of course, be the cause. But um, I think um, what she might say is, first of all, the, the gluing has just yesterday, I think, they made a public statement that they will no longer do that. So it's a very interesting development. So the, the, the climate, klima kleber, the, the people who glued themselves to the ground from the last generation, they, um, I think they even said that because it wasn't effective, that the, the tactic was just so unpopular, um, they decided they want to try different things. They're not going to do that anymore, which is interesting. That's, that's showing learning <laughs> in a very public way. Um, so I think, and, and Luisa, for example, was also um, very outspoken as a German climate activist um, that you know, people need to um, acknowledge what happened on October 7. And she, um, she said beautifully at some point, we, our hearts are big enough to take in the, to be empathetic with Israelis and Palestinians, for example. Um, but yes, there are conflicts within the movement. That is very normal. Anyone who has ever been in any movement knows that conflict is a very human thing. Um, my suspicion is that they will be able to mobilize this year because this is, this is the year with the most elections ever in the world. And young people really understand that their future is at stake. And I think even though the choices are not necessarily to their liking, they do have the ability to discern who is more on their side and who is less on their side. And um, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw, especially now that people are able to go out in the street again and, and mobilize, that we will see sort of a resurge in, in movement activity. Um, but I think, as someone who has been involved in the climate movement now for over a decade, I can also tell you we've never stopped. We have met every month. We have worked behind the scenes. There are laws that we would love for you to call your legislators about, and I can talk to you afterwards if you're um, willing to do that. Um, there is a lot going on that may not be as visible as marches in the streets, but um, but I think it, it can also be just as impactful, you know, working with artists, working, writing, um, doing a lot of work with education, 
right? We have to make sure that our kids are climate literate when they graduate, so that they understand what they're facing and they know what to do about it. That includes climate resilience, which is a big part of your climate action plan, right? Because sea level rise is baked in, it's gonna happen. And we need, it's happening, exactly. And we need to be ready for it. And, and we can't just let the kids run and, and not tell them what to do. They need to, be, they need to be able to handle it. And so I think this is something that, you know, every school should have required climate literacy so that, and at this point probably we need it for the teachers too because, you know, the teachers, they went to school before this was um, taught. <laughs> <laughs>